Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good morning, welcome to the 26th lecture on economics, management and entrepreneurship. If you recall, we were discussing about the uh, why depreciation occurs for different assets and uh, how to account for such depreciation. And we had illustrated basically three methods of depreciation accounting. One was straight line method, second was double declining balance method, third was the sum of the years digits method. And we have seen that starting with the initial investment when depreciations are calculated every year, then at the end of that year or those years we subtract those depreciation to get the book value and then it is desired that the book value at the end of the last year should be equal to the salvage value. In many cases salvage value is 0 and therefore, it becomes simply the initial investment to be recovered. Otherwise, it is P minus L the first cost minus the salvage value which is usually recovered in the process of depreciation accounting. Now, for the problem that we have taken, we will plot the depreciation or the book values against time and see how they actually behave. Now, in this graph, we have shown book value in the y axis and year in the x axis. Uh, of course, there is a it's not properly written 0 and this would have been 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. I think let us make it so that there is no there is clarity here that should be 1 Yes. Now, in this picture, we have shown that starting with uh, the initial cost or the first cost, or also what is known as the cost basis of 11,000 rupees, it comes down in 5 years to a salvage value of 1000 rupees. Now, in the straight line method, the book value reduces in a constant manner. So, this difference is 2000 in the first year, 2 more thousand in the second year. So, the accumulated depreciation is 4000 at the end of the second year. At the end of the third year, the accumulated depreciation is 6000. So, uh, 11000 minus 6000 is 5000. At the end of the fourth year, it is 3000 because the accumulated depreciation is 4 into 2000, 8000 and lastly 1000. Now, in the double declining balance method, this is the way by which the book value falls. That means, initially the depreciation charged is very high and slowly the value comes down. Whereas, the, at the sum of the years digits method also charges high amount of depreciation in the beginning and progressively less and less depreciation towards the as the years pass by. We will study the tax implications of such depreciation later. Now, there is yet another method which we had introduced which we had mentioned earlier and that is what we are now going to 
take up now that is called the sinking fund method. It is assumed that a series of equal payments are made into a sinking fund at the end of each year of the assets life to recover the amount P by L. So, if P by L is to be recovered at the end of the 5 years at the end of the n years then what equal amount we should pay into a sinking fund every year. So, that we get back this P minus L basically this is a situation of this type we are interested to get back P minus L amount at the end of n years. So, what amount we should invest or put in a bank every year such that at the end of n years this equivalent it will be equivalent to P minus L. So, this will be taken as the final sum P minus L the compound amount. So, P minus L to be multiplied with the factor sinking fund factor A given F R N. This is basically if you recall the sinking fund. So, it is as if a fund is created by investing certain amount every year such that its equivalent amount at the end of n years becomes P minus L the amount to be recovered. So, that is what is done here the amount deposited is taken as P minus L into this. So, this is the every year the amount is deposited and what is the depreciation then? Depreciation is the amount deposited into the sinking fund plus the interest earned on this amount during that particular year which means that suppose I invest this amount in the first year then the depreciation charged because it has not earned any interest in the first year the depreciation is the same amount that we had invested. But in the second year it will be the amount that we are putting into the fund plus the interest that we have earned on the on the amount that we had put at the end of the last year that is what is I am saying interest earned on the fund during the year. Now, thus the depreciations charged during various years are in the first year there is no interest because the investment is made at the end of the year. So, the D 1 the depreciation in the first year is just equal to P minus L into the sinking fund factor which va whose value is this, but in the second year it is P minus L into this if I add the interest along with the amount that I had invested this will be this is the amount that we will invest in the second year and the interest that will be in uh, that will be obtained on the investment that I had made in the end of the first year is this into 1 plus r this into r. So, if I add this this becomes r into 1 plus r and like this if I continue then at the end of the nth year the depreciation charged is P minus L into this expression. Now, let us take an example this example is the same example it is uh, the first cost is 11000 rupees the salvage value is 1000 rupees and the sinking fund factor is a given f r n and n is 5 years of course we remember that and the from the table the sinking fund factor value is obtained as 0.1638 multiplied by the difference to be amount to be recovered 10000. So, that gives us 1638 rupees per year. So, the depreciation during the first year is the same amount 1638 rupees, but depreciation in the second year is 1638 plus the interest earned on the amount invested so far which is 1638 and that is when summed is 1802 rupees. 
depreciation during the third year is the amount that we put into the sinking fund in the third year plus the total amount invested and the interest obtained there thereon. So, total amount invested was this and this together and the interest that it has earned in the third year is 10 percent of that and that is added with the new investment or new uh, amount that we had put in the sinking fund that makes it 1982. And like this when we proceed we get depreciation during the fourth year and depreciation during the fifth year. The amount are rupees 2180 and 2398. And if you add them up it should be equal to P minus L which is uh, 10,000. Now, the same diagram that I had shown earlier is now uh, we have now is now extended by putting the value for the uh, book value when obtained with the help of the sinking fund method. Now, look at this uh, previous diagram. Sorry. Yes. Now the previous diagram, uh, previous values are. You look at this. Depreciation was one six three eight. Depreciation increases. Whereas in other uh, cases, particularly double declining balance method, and in the sinking fund method, uh, in the sum of the years digits method look at this is the sum of the years digits method depreciation was decreasing and same was the story for double declining balance method. But in the case of sinking fund method the depreciation values are rising. So, it means that here in the first year the depreciation is less, this difference is less, this is less, in the second year it is more, in the third year it is still more and in the fifth year it is the highest. Basically, this is 1000, this is 11000 this is the straight line method. In sum of the years or digits method, if this is the first year, then the depreciation charged was only this. In the second year, the depreciation charged for the straight line method was same. In the third year, depreciation charged was this. So, they are all equal. Whereas, in the double declining balance method, the depreciation charged is in the first year it is much higher and then in the second year it is this, in the third year it is this. So, you can see that the depreciation in the first year is the is higher than that in the second year which is higher than that in the third year and so on and so forth. So, here depreciation amount reduces as time progresses. Now, we are facing a situation in the sinking fund method where it is just the opposite. In this, in the first year the depreciation charge is less, in the second year the depreciation charge is higher, in the third year the depreciation charge is even higher. So, this is higher than that and this is even higher than this. Thus, we see that in the sinking fund method, the 
the depreciation charge during various years increase over time. Now, this has a resemblance with the actual phenomenon that occurs in nature. The depreciation, the actual physical depreciation or even functional depreciation of assets take place more later into the life. As time progresses, the deterioration is much faster. Therefore, sinking fund method more or less emulates the natural phenomenon of deterioration of value of an asset. However, this is not preferred in practice because of tax implications as we shall see very soon. What is preferred is either straight line method or double declining balance method with a switch over to straight line method. Let us see what we am what we are trying to say. So, this brings us to the discussion on taxes. First of all, let us understand that there are different types of taxes. We will be discussing only this central tax and the state taxes. Here also there are certain variations. How are state taxes charged and how is central tax charged? Each has got its own percentage fixed by respective states and center. From country to country also the tax rules change. Sometimes the state taxes are tax deductible and sometimes they are not. Sometimes state taxes are charged after uh, or rather on income after the central taxes are deducted. So, we shall see the implications here. Firstly, let us understand the central tax can vary from nearly 15 percent to 40 percent that changes every year on the net income before tax. We have already discussed this net income before tax is taxable or profit before tax this is what I am trying to say PBT. On that the taxes are charged and the state taxes are usually less it can vary from 6 to 12 percent or even little different on net income less the central tax. That means, net income before tax minus the central tax whatever remains on that state taxes are charged, but once again the practice may differ from country to country. Therefore, after paying all taxes net income after all taxes will be how much? It will be NIBT into central tax to be subtracted from NIBT. So, that makes it NIBT multiplied by 1 minus central tax and on this the state taxes will be charged and subtracted to find out the net income after all taxes. Therefore, this is equal to net income before tax multiplied by 1 minus central taxes multiplied by 1 minus state taxes. If I call this as NIBT to BT multiplied by 1 minus effective tax rate, then I can find out what is or how effective tax rate is related to central and state taxes. I equate this, I get 1 minus effective tax rate equals 1 minus central taxes into 1 minus state taxes. From here, I can derive effective tax rate as equal to 1 minus 1 minus central rate into 1 minus state rate or it can be written as state rate plus central rate into 1 minus state rate. Now, this can be also given another interpretation. If state tax is tax deductible when central tax is calculated then how it is to be done state taxes to be first of all estimated it is equal to NIBT into state rate and then central tax will be calculated on NIBT because this is tax deductible 
we subtract this state tax giving n i b t into 1 minus state rate. So, this is the amount on which the central tax will be calculated. So, into central rate that is the central tax. Hence, the total tax is state tax plus central tax which is equal to n i b t into state rate plus 1 minus state rate into central rate. Hence, the effective tax rate comes same as before which is state rate plus 1 minus state rate into central rate. Just see this was the same thing that we had obtained earlier and we are also getting the same thing here. In any case once we determine or once we know the state tax rate and the effective tax rate we can now add or use both these information to find out the effective tax rate. Once the effective tax rate is known we can now find out its implication on or its impact on the depreciation and therefore, on the cash flows into the company. Before we do that let us also take up another item that is often assets are disposed of at a particular value which is called the market value which may be different from the book value that we have written. Take a case that suppose we had uh, got an asset at a price P and for 3 years we have used the asset the book value has come down to B V 3 because after 3 years the depreciations would have to be or will have to be deducted from the first cost to give the book value at the end of three, third year. Suppose at that point of time we sell the asset, if we sell that asset then the market value will not be exactly equal to the book value that we have mentioned in our books of account, it will be greater or less or accidentally it may also be exactly equal. If it is exactly equal to the book value then there is no tax implication, but if it is sold at a higher price then the gain is taxable and if it is sold at a lower price then the loss will be also considered in the tax that means you will get some refund for payment of tax that you have made earlier. This is what is the topic here gain or loss on disposal on assets a company can sell an asset at a price which is the market value MV, the book value of the asset could be BV. If market value is greater than book value, it is a gain on the disposal of the asset and it is referred to as depreciation recapture. Because it is a gain, the company has to pay tax on this gain and the tax liability is the difference that means the gain multiplied by effective tax rate. Whereas, if the market value is less than BV then it is a loss the company saves taxes and that amount is equal to book value minus market value into the effective tax rate. This is illustrated with the help of an example. A company had bought a piece of equipment at a price of rupees 1 million, the accumulated depreciation amounts to rupees 800,000, which means that the book value is 1 million minus 800,000, 200,000 is the book value. The company could sell the equipment at a price of rupees 250,000. So, market value is 250,000, the book value is 2000. So, it is a gain on disposal. The question is compute the gain or loss on disposal and the tax liability or tax saving if the effective tax rate is 30 percent. It is very simple first compute book value which is this minus this giving 200,000 rupees. The market value is 250,000 there is a gain on disposal the gain is equal to 50,000 
and this is therefore a tax liability. The company has to give tax on this amount that it has gained and this is equal to 15,000 rupees after multiplying with the 30 percent tax rate. So, this is quite simple. Now, let us talk about the effect of depreciation on cash flow after tax. Recall that taxes are paid on the basis of the net income, which is the gross revenue minus all expenses. All expenses include expenses that does not include depreciation and then finally, depreciation. Now, let us write that down in a different way. We call this before tax cash flow BTCF before tax cash flow in period K. So, all the revenues that is the inflow minus all the expenses E k during that period. Now, after tax cash flow will be from R k minus E k you have to subtract the taxes paid. Taxes paid tax will be calculated on R k minus E k minus D k minus D k because depreciation is really not a cash flow. So, it is shown separately because taxes are charged on revenues minus the expenses less uh, expenses not including depreciation and then depreciation are charged or subtracted separately. We are shown this D, D is also an expense, but we are showing it separately because our interest is to find out how depreciation affects the tax and therefore, the, the cash flow. So, this becomes R k minus E k into 1 minus T, this is minus and minus makes it plus, plus T D. So, we see here that because of depreciation there is a tax saving minus d k it is subtracted therefore, there is a tax saving and therefore, the cash flow increases we have more cash because we do not have to pay taxes on account of depreciation. So, after tax saving resulting from depreciation is t into d k. Now, this equation can be written in another fashion if I write down this as 1 minus t into R k minus E k minus D k because this is exactly the taxes paid this is plus D k. So, it is as if the cash flow increases because of depreciation this is called a non cash flow it increases it helps in increases increasing the after tax cash flow. So, this is the implication of depreciation that means, more the depreciation more will be its contribution towards cash inflow because there is a tax saving to the extent of T into D k. So, higher the D higher is the tax saving and higher is the contribution to cash inflow. Now, here is an example an asset with a cost basis of rupees 1 million is depreciated as follows. So, these are the depreciation calculations. The net revenues are 250,000 every year that means, R i minus A i 250,000 every year and these are the depreciations. If MARR is 10 percent after tax MARR is 10 percent and effective tax rate is 40 percent is the purchase of the asset justified. So, this is pictorized in this form what are given these are the things given the first cost is 1 million rupees 
tax is 40 percent R k minus E k is given as 250,000 rupees in the net revenue and D k are given in the table. Now, recall that after tax cash flow is R k minus E k into 1 minus T plus T into D k. We know D k. D k is 200,000 uh, 200, in years 2, 3, 4 and 5 and 100,000 in the first year and the sixth year. So, this is a cash flow diagram. In the first year it is 100,000 into tax 0.4 T into D k. So, this is T, this is D k that is the first year cash flow and the sixth year cash flow is also is the same 100,000 into 0.4. And in the second, third, fourth, and fifth years, it is 200,000 decay multiplied by 40 percent. So, it is this. Now, ATCF is RK minus CK into 1 minus T, RK minus CK is given as 250,000, 1 minus T is 1 minus 0.4. So, this is the net receipt in cash flow that we are getting over the years. So, this is a annuity every year we are getting these receipts and this is plus d k therefore, these are all inflows of cash and this is the only outflow of 1 million rupees. So, we calculate the present worth. Once we draw the cash flow diagram, we are in a position to find out the present worth of all the future cash inflows and the present is minus 1 million plus 100,000 into 0.4 into this is a single payment I am considering a single payment present worth factor and then the last one is a sixth year taking place at the sixth year. So, it is a single payment present worth factor considering that as f and this also as f whereas, these are equal payment series. So, for the first one it is 250,000 into 1 minus 0 0.4 into it is equal payment series present worth factor p given a 0.16 for 6 years this is occurring. So, it is single uh, equal payment series present worth factor and for this one it is 200,000 multiplied by 0.4. First of all we bring it to this point. So, it is equal payment series present worth factor and then from here we bring it to this point. So, this is single payment present worth factor for one year. Find out the values of the factors from the interest tables, put them and find out P w. If P w is greater than 0, then the investment is economically justified, else not. So, we can see the depreciation changes or increases the cash flow and therefore, it has significant contribution to increasing the profitability of a particular project. Now, tax is paid on gross profit which is computed by subtracting all costs from sales revenue one component of cost is the machine depreciation. If the depreciation is high during a year, then the cost is more and profit is less and therefore, tax paid is less. Thus, tax paid has an inverse relationship with depreciation charged. Now, we are basically trying to 
now compare the different depreci depreciation accounting methods. In particular, we will compare the sinking fund method and the declining balance method. If you remember, in the declining balance method, the depreciation is charged the highest in the first year and then it progressively reduces. Whereas, in the sinking fund method, the depreciation charged is the highest in the last year and in the first year it is less and less and less. So, we will take a particular example and show that so how it impacts tax and how which is actually economically better. We do that with the help of this particular example. We assume the following values for a particular company. Annual sales revenue are given as 100,000 rupees. Annual costs basically expenses when I am writing cost basically I, am, I should mean it by expenses except depreciation is rupees 90,000. Tax rates 20,000 interest rate 10 percent and tax paid during any year i is given as 100,000 minus 10,000 uh, 90,000 minus d i on this the taxes will be calculated the tax rate is 20 percent. So, it is equal to 10,000 minus d i into 0 0.2. So, this is the tax paid during every uh, every year. So, that depends on the depreciation charged during that year. Now, for the problem that we have taken the double declining balance method gives these values as the tax paid and the sinking fund method gives these values. So, because the depreciation charged was very high, the taxable income was low and therefore, the tax paid was low in the first year. Sinking fund method, the depreciation was low in the first year, therefore, the tax paid was high, the net income was high and the tax paid was high. And here the tax paid increases as time progresses, here tax paid reduces as time progresses. However, arithmetically the total tax paid is the same, but the present worth of these cash flows, these are cash outflows, the present worth of these cash outflows is will be different present worth of the taxes paid for the double declining balance method is coming to 6393 rupees. For the sinking fund method it is coming to 7445 rupees. So, you can see that although the arithmetic sum of the tax paid is the same for both the present worth is higher of the tax paid is higher for the sinking fund method. So, this means that whenever the depreciation is increasing over time this is not a desirable phenomenon from the point of view of taxes and therefore, from the point of view of the companies and that is the reason why the double declining balance method is always preferred in practice. Now, we take up a topic that is similar, but not exactly similar to depreciation. Many companies such as mining companies, they, they have certain assets that do not depreciate, they are actually used up, that is they get depleted. Assets decrease their values as time progresses. Similarly, for mining companies their assets they get depleted over time. The difference is that in normal businesses which do not have such natural resources that deplete over time with the help of a depreciation fund 
you can acquire new assets, new assets or new machines or equipments or buildings. But natural resources cannot be easily recovered. You cannot get natural resources that you have depleted as you would like to have. In many cases what happens the owners get not only the profit, but also the amount that they have consumed up from their natural resources. And if the natural resources get completely depleted, they may go out of business unless they acquire more assets of similar type or of a different type. That means, they may go or change over to another business unless they acquire similar businesses or similar resources, similar natural resources. Therefore, there is a little difference between depreciation and depletion, but the similarity is that over time they get consumed up. So, this is what we are trying to say depreciation reduces the value of an asset, the accumulated depreciation is ploughed back for reinvestment in case of depreciation. In depletion, depletion this is also an, is an expense. The retained earnings, however, is given back to the owners because replacing exhausted natural resource is difficult, if not impossible. What the owners get back is his profit and a portion of the depletion amount. Ultimately, the owner may wind up his business. Occasionally, he may own another natural resource and continues with the business. Now, how to calculate the depletion allowance? There are two methods. One is the cost method, the other is the percentage method. And depletion allowance is taken as the larger of the two figures. That means, we calculate depletion allowance with the help of the cost method and then calculate with the help of the percentage method, whichever is larger is taken as the depletion allowance. First the cost method. Cost method is find out your uh, the number of units remaining to be mined. I am saying mined because I am assuming a mining resource. So, it could be so many tons of coal if it is a coal mine and what is its price. So, total price divided by total amount of the resource in terms of tons or kg or area, hectare or volume or whatever that is called depletion unit. And in a particular year you might have consumed and sold some of the assets. So, that is the number of units sold during that year into the depletion unit is the depletion allowance. The percentage method is that certain percentage of the gross profit provided it does not exceed 50 percent of the net income before deduction of the depletion allowance. We will illustrate this with the help of an example. That will be that will clarify the two methods. A company bought a plot of land for 20 million rupees. Mine reserves are estimated to be 500,000 tons. So, the land contains a mine, the reserves are estimated to be 500,000 tons and 50,000 tons of ores are mined during the first year. 40,000 were sold that yielded a gross income of 2 million rupees. The net income became 800,000. What is the depletion allowance for year 1? We use both the methods. First the cost method. To use the cost method, we have to know depletion unit, how much we have consumed 
in one year. For that, uh, no, first of all, we will have to find out the cost of the land, which is 20 million rupees. The reserves are 500,000. So, if you add this, uh, if you sub divide this 20 million by 500,000, we get 4 rupees per ton. We call this the depletion unit per unit cost basically. And we have, we have mined 50,000 tons in the first year. Let us take an example to illustrate how the depletion allowance is calculated. The example is like this. A company bought a plot of land for rupees 20 million. Mine reserves are estimated to be 500,000 tons. If 50,000 tons of ores are mined during the first year and 40,000 tons were sold in that year yielding a gross income of rupees 2 million and net income of rupees 800,000. What is the depletion allowance for year 1? So, first we calculate the depletion unit. We have the resource of 500,000 tons that costs us rupees 20 million. So, per unit charge or per unit cost is 4 rupees per ton. This is the depletion unit and how much we have actually sold. Although we have mined 50,000 tons, we have sold 40,000 tons. So, 40,000 into 4 is 160 thousand rupees. Therefore, the book value after the first year will be 20 million minus 160,000. So, that is 19 million 840,000 rupees after the first year. Now, the percentage method according to that the depletion allowance is some percentage of the gross income. Normally, various governments they prescribed depending on the type of resource what should be this percentage. Let us assume that it is 15 percent of the gross income. The depletion allowance therefore, is 15 percent of whatever is given as gross income. Gross income is given as 2 million rupees. So, 2 million rupees of 15 percent of that is 300,000 rupees. The allowable depletion allowance as I have told you is 50 percent of the net income. Net income is given as 800,000 rupees. 50 percent of that is 400,000 rupees. So, this depletion allowance should not exceed 50 percent of the net income. Therefore, we make a comparison of these two. The depletion allowance according to the percentage method therefore, becomes the minimum of the two which is 300,000 rupees. So, in the percentage method the depletion allowance should be 300,000 rupees, but According to the cost method, the amount depletion allowance is 160,000 rupees and we take the higher of the two. The depletion allowance for this problem therefore, is depletion allowance by cost method, depletion allowance by percentage method, whichever is higher is taken as the depletion allowance for that year. In this case, it is 300,000 rupees. Therefore, the book value should not be 20 million minus 160, but it should be 20 million minus 300,000, which is therefore 19,700, 19,700,000 rupees. So, this is how 
cost methods are calculated. We stop here today and we will take up some more topics and some exercises in our next class. Thank you.